Um, so uh, there is there's there's an eclipse coming, and this is really really exciting. I think it's a wonderful way to kind of get ourselves to get a little bit of perspective on our relationship to the cosmos. So um, uh, today I've got a special guest with us. I'll bring you on. Um, Kay Hones um, is a, a has volunteered this year as a um, as an ambassador for the eclipse to help people enjoy it safely. And um, I'm really uh, appreciative to you for for joining us today um, to talk about resources that you're aware of and how we might kind of make the most of this eclipse and enjoy it. Um, and also, I'm going to be sharing some strategies and ideas that I have um, for uh, nature journaling, specifically nature journaling with uh, with eclipses, but this is, it's, it's just, it's going to be a really fun event. What are you particularly, uh, what, what gets you excited about this? What, what is the most fun about kind of eclipseness for you? Well, I just think it's an interesting phenomenon and I'm going to share a few things because we're not going to really see it here in the Bay area, but if you guys are in Texas or in Canada or in Mexico, you are going to be able to see it. Um, first, I want to mention about the ambassador program, uh, the the Astro Astronomical Society of the Pacific here in, Cal in San Francisco, the oldest astronomical society west of the Mississippi, uh, has a lot of different programs. And I went to uh, something on the eclipse and they said, do you want to be an ambassador? And I thought, why not? And my background is school library and art. So, you know, I'm out of my, you know, comfort zone. But I'm going to put some links in of if you're interested in getting uh, an ambassador, if you live in other parts of this, uh, the country or even overseas, how you can contact with an email. And if they have information, they'll send it to you uh, for your area. Um, I wanted to first show a map of the total eclipse. So you can see it's through Mexico, through Texas, Cleveland, and up into Canada. So that was that's what I start out when I'm working with, with uh, K-12 students, showing them the map and talking about the different places. And unfortunately, it's not here. Um, the next thing I talk to the students about is, of course, what I think is the most important is safety. And so what I have um, is I have the um, solar sunglasses and... Uh, it's really, really important because even the high school kids that I work with, they said, yeah, we've looked at the sun. I said, no, don't look at the sun. So I will get, be putting a link up. You can get these through the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And I have a um, resource sheet that I'll have a link for that is in Spanish and English. And most of the students I work with are um, either bilingual or Spanish speaking. And I think it's really important to have resources in the different languages if possible. So those are the first couple things I wanted to talk about. And then um, I have, this is, I don't have extra copies, but this is a three hole punch, pinhole projector. And it says right at the very beginning, do not use this card to look directly at the sun. <laughs> so we're going to really emphasize not looking directly at the sun. So basically, uh, it has some directions, and you can use it with your back to the sun, and then you look and see where the sun is shining through the holes, and you can move it around, and there's different activities that you can do. And what I've done is I put a link uh, that will help you make uh, your own pinhole uh, projectors with yourself or your students. Then the next thing I want to talk about very briefly is the, um, the mythology around the eclipse and the one I there's a lot and I'm going to have a link there but the one I wanted to talk about was the Pomo Native Americans that live um in the um uh, I think it's the Sacramento area of California and they used to say one day a bear was walking in the sky and it bumped into the sun who was walking in the opposite direction the sun told the bear move out of the way but the bear insisted the sun was the one who should move because both were stubborn, they yelled at each other a while, but neither one would move. You know the kids love this. Eventually, they, 
Their tempers boiled over and they started to fight. The bear tracked the sun, tackled the sun and bit him and blocked his rays to the earth below. Eventually the sun was able to wrestle free from the bear, bringing the light back to the earth. After their fight, the bear and the sun resumed their walks, but every once in a while, the bear and the sun would bump into each other again and have another fight. Oh, and that... this is the Pomo name for a solar eclipse means sun got bit by bear. So I think these are really, I love them. And there's so many different um, myths from around the world. And I think it's really valuable for the kids and for everybody. It's just very interesting. So the exploratory, oh, first I'm going to talk about, let's see. Uh, shadow tracing, and this is from PBS and from NASA. It's about exploring the sun's position by tracing shadows on the ground and the sidewalk. And then the next one that um, I'm just going to talk about real briefly, and it's called um, the Earth and the Moon Eclipse in a Cup. And you have three plastic cups, easy to do. And then one of them you cut, so the the cup with the moon on it is the same as the sun. And then the others, you do some measurement with the others, and then you make the little earth. Mine isn't very round. The kids will do such a better job. And then you make a little tiny moon, which is a fourth the size of the sun. Again, they're doing all this math. It's and then there's a lot of activities that you can do. And as I, I told Jack when I, when I did this yesterday with the, the teenagers, I had them start out with it. And then I said, and your science teacher is going to talk to you about the experiments. So um, Exploratorium, they're called snacks. They have a zillion different resources. And I would really recommend that as a source. And then last but not least, you know I can't leave you without talking about a book. Now, this isn't exactly an eclipse book, and there are a lot of them out there which you can get. But this is a wonderful book called, this is the picture of the actual author, Farm Worker to Astronaut, My Path to the Stars. It's in Spanish and English. It's by Jose Hernandez. This is my friend, uh, uh, librarian Nancy Lucero, that we went to see him in Sacramento uh, a couple months ago. And he signed the book for her, of course. But I would really recommend it. And again, it's in two languages, which for the students that I work with, we're mostly Spanish speaking. It's really wonderful. Not only to have a, a, a book in, in their language, but also uh, this is a, a, a story, a biography of someone, an autobiography of someone that uh, they can relate to uh, culturally. So I think there are a lot of things out there that you can look for. And of course, check with your librarian if you need another book. But thank you very much. And I hope this is helpful. I'm going to put all these links into the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, we appreciate that. I want to encourage people to um, copy those links from the chat. Um, while the meeting is going on, you can just go click, click, click and and open them. And then when you're done with this uh, workshop, they will be open and available in the background. Um, so what I'd like to do is to uh, add to these resources with some um, other uh, strategies and approaches for playing with the Eclipse and your nature journal. And let me see here. I'm going to play this and Zoom is going to. So I'm, I'm going to first show you, um, I want to show you some of, um, some, some, some photographs of the sorts of things that you can do and then also share some journal pages. And um, then it will be, um, fun for us to also brainstorm about what are some other possibilities we can of things we can do with our nature journals. When the phenomenon of the eclipse happens, there's going to be two really interesting things going on. One is everything that's happening with the sun. And 
that's a cool phenomenon. And then, but if we get just focused on the sun, we're going to miss a whole bunch of other phenomena that are happening simultaneously. So what I want to um, encourage you to do is that during the eclipse itself, in addition to looking at the sun, be looking at what is going on in nature around you. For instance, um, what is going on with temperature at different times during this eclipse? Um, if you have a way of easily recording the temperature, you're going to be able to notice an interesting thing about what happens with, 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 with temperature in the middle of the day. Um, another thing which we want to pay attention to is how are the critters, how is nature responding to this? It's going to be weird for us. It's going to be weird for the critters. So if you are under... Um, under the path of the totality, at totality, it gets really dark. It's nighttime in the middle of the day. And <laughs> birds are going to be going like, wait a minute, <laughs> what, um, what's going on here? And so to, if you know bird song, or if, if you have the Merlin app, which identifies all the bird songs, want to see if this sudden darkening triggers bird song. A lot of birds start singing right at dusk and at, at, at dawn. So you want to see, are these birds responding to that? So if you have the hypothesis that the birds are responding to daylight to get them to sing, or the, the, as it's getting darker, then you would expect them to sing that. But what if they're, they kind of have bird clocks and they're looking at something else? Well, then it could be getting dark in the middle of the day and you um, and they'll be going like, huh, it's getting dark in the middle of the day, but it's not time for me to sing. So you can actually figure some things out about what is triggering critters to do what by your own observations. So having your radar out for like, what do the insects do? What do the birds do? Um, some plants open and close in response to light. So the more critters and um, other phenomena that you are near at that point, you'll have an opportunity for checking out some really interesting things. So for these in our metadata, sometimes I don't think of exactly what time it is as being important for my metadata. It's going to be really important for this. And um, let me now show you some ways that um, I'm going to be uh, geeking out with this. And I'm going to share a screen. Here we go. Oh, look, it's night. Um, so this contraption here is my personal favorite viewing technique for looking at the sun. When I want to stare directly at the sun, <laughs> um, I don't. Um, the, uh, this is a spotting scope. It's a bird spotting scope. And what I've done is I have turned it up towards the sun and made a square card with a little hole in it that I poke the uh, the large lens through. I don't look through the telescope to try to find the sun because then, yes, I would blind myself and that ruins your whole day. Um, not only is looking at the sun a bad idea, looking at the sun through a telescope is an even worse idea because all that light, light is now um, focused on your eyeball. It's about as good an idea as taking a magnifying glass that you use to focus light and doing that on your eyeball. Um, so instead, um, what I do is I just look at the shadow on a flat surface. So I look at here, I've, uh, we've got a little white tablecloth. And you see that circle that is down there? That circle is not round because the uh, eyepiece 
is round. So you, when we first look at this, you might say like, oh yeah, this is just, there's a round circle at the top, there's a round circle at the bottom. That is a projection of the sun. And when you focus it with the focus knob on the telescope, you can see the sunspots and everything. So as an eclipse starts to happen, that then gets projected whatever you see happening here so this is looking at a annular eclipse the last eclipse i got underneath uh its full part it wasn't a total solar eclipse it was an annular eclipse that at the height of things made a ring and if you look and so what i'm doing is i'm just using that as a projection down into onto my, the page of my of my sketchbook and um the uh so you can see here again that's the light of the sun coming through the projector behind me and then onto the piece of paper in in, in front of me so i can trace the shape of the sun during an eclipse using this tool here um was a point close to totality and you can see how you're seeing the, sh the shape of the moon coming across the surface of the sun. Do you notice that little dark speck in the crescent at about, let's see, about four o'clock? See that little dark speck? That's a sunspot. So with using this approach, you can actually project sunspots, all the spots on the moon, and then all the spots on the sun, and then uh, be able to translate that to a piece of paper. So it's really cool. Um, anything that has a hole in it, though, you can also, uh, if you don't have a scope, you can get a projection of the sun. This is, you know, what, what object am I holding in my hand? What have I got here? That's a colander. That's a kitchen strainer, right? So I, it had a bunch of holes in it. And here's the cool thing. The holes were square. It, had, it was a colander with square holes. And each one of those then makes a crescent um, because it's a, not a, it's not the shadow of the hole. It's working like a pinhole camera to give you a, an actual projection of the sun. So that's something that's neat about that card that Kay held up, um, that you'd expect the round hole to be a round sun, the square hole to be a square sun. If you have that piece of paper and the triangle hole to be a triangle sun, um, but you, if you hold that piece of paper very close to the thing that you're going to be um, projecting on, you would see a square, a triangle, and a circle. But if you move the, uh, the, the piece of paper further away from the surface that you're projecting on, everything turns into a projection of the sun. So that's really cool. And one of my favorite phenomena during an eclipse is walking underneath a tree and looking at, because each little, um, again, if each hole in the colander is a, um, if each hole in the colander is a, casts a projection of the sun independent of its shape, so too does each hole in the branches uh, and, and, and in the shadow below a tree. Any little, any shape of any size below that tree is going to cast a little projection of the sun. That's a quarter uh, or, uh, uh, or was, that, was that a penny? I don't remember what I put on the ground now. <laughs> I should have put down a ruler, um, but isn't that cool? Um, that gives you a, a sense of, um, of, of what's going on. Um, 
Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So here's a, a, a close up of, you can see that little sunspot there. Um, so those are just a few of my favorite um, ways of, of recording phenomena. That projector made out of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a spotting scope. It's, it's just, let me grab the scope for you. So that's a, this is an old telescope that uh, my neighbor, when I was a kid, uh, Grace Hall was this wonderful woman who lived down the street. She liked to watch birds um, and her eyesight got so bad that she couldn't really see the birds very well anymore. And she got herself a little telescope and finally got so bad that she couldn't um, uh, e even use this to watch the birds in her backyard. Um, and she gave it to me when I was a young naturalist. So thank you, Grace. I'm still using your, your scope. As you can see, it's been on a lot of adventures. All I'm doing is pointing this end towards the sun, and I'm not doing it this way. Oh, yeah, there's the sun, right? It's in a, I put it in a little stand, and I just move it around with that shield on it until I see a circle down there on the ground. And then I can focus that circle to make it crisp. And when it, uh, using this little focus knob, when that becomes crisp, all right, I see all the sunspots down there. I now have this projector. So this makes a sun projector. And that is, that's cool. That's, that's, that's really fun. Let me show you kind of what the pages look like um, of things that I did with the last eclipse. And you do want to get those glasses because, uh, when it need to, it's neat to, 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 to just stare straight up there. But if you're, if you're doing these projections, let's, let's take a look at, go to this document camera. May I also add a quick note about, about those glasses as well? Yes. Um, from what I've heard, the most dangerous time is right after the totality ends because people will be used to it being a bit dark with the corona and then the sun, suddenly then you see the light again. And the and because your pupils will be dilated or no um no not not dilated, um yeah suddenly the light changes and it does something not so great to your eyes um, because your eyes have adjusted to the dark and then suddenly you have light again so it's right after that's usually the time people forget. That's 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 really uh, wise yeah there there's there is uh, at the totality. Uh, my understanding is you can look up at the sun, but the minute it stops and the sun starts to peek through, it's going to come through crazy bright. So you have to have a timer set to let you know before that happens. Um, and very often it'll sort of jump through a, a sort of a crater around the edge. You'll kind of get some little kind of diamond ring effects where um, you know, all of a sudden whoop, you'll get that light reappearing. So this was the annular eclipse that I saw in Texas, uh, October 14th of last year. You can see here is a circle of the sun. Here are sunspots on it. Here are those sunspots. Here are those same sunspots. All I'm doing is putting this sketchbook underneath the, the, the projection and tracing the projection. So I originally traced things just with a, a purple pencil here, right? And sort of lightly traced that in and then came over that with an ink line. Um, or here what I'm doing is I am, um, I'm just putting, I got a Tombow brush pen and put in the shape of the, and so you can see this thing starting each one with its little time. So this was, 1020, this is 11 minutes later, right? So I'm getting this progressively here. And I'm also, um, this is what I'm seeing on the projection. This is what I see when I look up at the sun with my sun, with the, with the special eclipse glasses on. And so what you'll see, what you see here is that my projection 
has inverted the image. So if I were just looking at the sun, I would be seeing this that's different than my projection. So I wanted to get both of those things on there. Then what I did is we got closer and, and, and closer. These little insets are what I see with the, the glasses. Here are some little notes about what is happening um, with the shadows under the trees as we're getting closer and closer, right? Um, until I get what uh, with the annular eclipse, that's uh, what they call the ring of fire. All right, so in this eclipse at its maximum point, um, there is, you see a circle in the sky instead of the sun being completely occluded. And we'll, we'll look at, at, at why in a minute. Um, so uh, that's so if this is sort of the ring of fire moment. And then here is dancing rings below the trees. So I'm looking underneath the trees. There are all these little rings going. And that was just really cool. Um, there was no, so I'm making comments. There's no wind, right? And then it starts to come back. And at 121, it was it was all over. So this was how I documented that eclipse. Um, on a just since we're kind of looking at Nature Journal entries here, um, this was on a lunar eclipse. Um, tracking that. Now, lunar eclipses are really kind of democratic events. Everybody on the dark side of the Earth will be able to see the same lunar eclipse. For a solar eclipse, you have to get right underneath the path in order to be able to see it. Um, so those are some of my best ideas about how to record an eclipse. Um, let me go back to this. So this is this is fun. So projecting things, you could put your 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 piece of paper down underneath a projection from a tree above you and trace that directly onto the page of your journal. Um, you could make a projector system with a telescope. You could get some special glasses that allow you to look up. Now, by the way, sunglasses don't work, right? So these are special glasses for actually looking at the sun. Um, and if you've got an old pair from a previous eclipse that haven't been taken care of and have been kind of stuffed in a drawer, we advise you to get a new pair because you don't want the, any of the film on these to be scratched. But if they've been really well curated, um, then uh, you're probably in 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 good shape. But um, you, uh, if when you look through uh, your glasses, if things sort of seem bright to you, get some different glasses. You also might want to test these by going out and looking up at the sun with your old glasses um, before the eclipse happens, so that you know that you're ready to go. Um, one. Other thing that I want to kind of encourage people to do, to think about as you're doing this, is to think about, use this as an opportunity for contemplating your place in the cosmos. When there is a solar eclipse, what is the relationship between the sun, the moon, and the earth? What's going on up there? And can you make a diagram of that? Actually, let's try that right now. Just on a little piece of paper right now in front of you. Can you make a little doodle showing the sun, the earth, the, the moon? What is happening when you do this? And by the way, this is just sort of seeing, like if, if you're thinking, like, I'm not sure, just do your best guess. Like maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of explore that in, in, in just a... Uh, 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 a, a moment, but I I like using these as opportunities to just try to get my 
um, my brain to float around um, off the planet and kind of look at the relationship of these objects. And um, as, 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 as an opportunity for an out-of-body experience. Do you have your doodle? Um, because let's take a look at, at what's going on at that moment. And another neat thing about this is the sort of the idea that, um, physics doesn't always work the way we think think it would and like trying to figure out like what's happening here and why what's going on these things are really really interesting let's um let's let's go back to this document camera and um i'm going to make a little a little drawing here All right so the <clears throat> One sort of easy way of visualizing what is happening with uh, with an eclipse is um, I'm going to put my sun over here. This is not to scale. There's my sun. And I'm going to put my earth here. Again, not to scale. Now, if my sun is over here, light from the sun is coming this way, and it's hitting the Earth. And that means that there's a day side and a night side of the Earth. So I'm just going to draw a line and color this in. So there is my Earth with my day side and my light night side. Separate from this is, oh, and also, also here on the night, what's going on here with the night, is that uh, we've got the shadow side here. But also, if you were to be right here, where my pencil tip is, where my pen tip is, you would still be in the shadow of the Earth. The Earth actually has a shadow that projects out into space away from the sun in a line pointing directly away from the sun. And so that's our that's our shadow side. It's actually a little cone of shadow that travels around with us. Now, if my moon, as it is going around the Earth, imagining it coming up out of my page here, crossing over, and then disappearing into the page here, going around on the other side. If my moon is traveling around like that, or actually what I can do, I can... I can have it go that way. On this diagram, I can also have it go this way around my, um, around the Earth. So I'm going to have, for the purposes of this diagram, I'm going to orbit this way, right? So here's the little moon. It's going. Sometimes it's over here. Right? Sometimes it's over here. Sometimes it's over here. Sometimes it's over here. So, so if, um, yep. sorry, sorry to interrupt you, just to double check and clarify. So that means we're having sort of an overhead view or as if we're looking down at the North Pole. Um, yeah, so, yes, yeah, so, yeah, that's right. So here's my little pole. And yeah, so there's my, that's, that's my, uh, my moon moving around it. Now, let's see, is the moon going to be going around this way or is the moon going to be going around this way let's see if we can figure that out if this is the north pole and the moon is as the Earth is spinning every day, that gives you um, a sunrise and sunset. If it is rising in the east and setting in the west, that means that the moon, the Earth is spinning this way. 
And if the moon is rising a little bit uh, later every day, yep, I think our moon is going this direction. Um, so over here in this position, if this moon goes happens as it's going around here, goes into the path of into the shadow of the Earth, this is your lunar eclipse. So this right here is a lunar eclipse. And as it goes into the shadow of the Earth, this is where you have your moon turning red. So again, that is there we go. So that is that's this kind of an effect where everybody on this side of the planet can see it. But let's think about this solar eclipse. The moon also has its own shadow that here is just projecting off into space, is projecting off into space. Here, it's projecting down onto the planet. So if you happen to be right there, you get to see the solar eclipse. And that's why only people who are right there get to see the solar eclipse. And as the moon goes across the face of the Earth, it traces a line. So everybody on that line on the face of the Earth gets to see the solar eclipse. Everybody gets to see the lunar eclipse. Probably everybody here has seen a lunar eclipse. But you have to have really great timing to be able to see the solar eclipse. So I I think it's, it's something that is, is fun to do as you're looking at at eclipses is just to sort of play with diagrams like this. And um, that is, uh, as, as, I, as I kind of go through this journal, second, let's just sort of bring that in again. There we go. Um, so if, let's zoom out. Partly, part of what I'm doing is I'm recording the experience that I'm having. You also see me kind of getting meta here, right? What is, what is happening with the positions of the of the of the 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 earth the moon and the sun what gives me the patterns that i'm seeing so I want to encourage people to also just sort of contemplate that larger picture um let's now go back to this screen and what I'm uh, interested uh, in is to, to hear from you other ideas that people have of things that we could do um, when we are able to see an eclipse. Um, oh, I, actually, here, here's, here's some other things. You think to yourself, like, gosh, I would like to see that. Um, something that... Um, Here's here's th this th this idea is still kind of just starting, but I, I was looking around at a at a map of what are all the upcoming solar eclipses, right? And I was thinking to myself, like these are pretty cool, and we want to go see these. If I could happen to be somewhere else on the planet where there is one of those eclipses at the time that there's an eclipse, that's really cool. And we've just been really lucky in the last two years, there's two big eclipses, one an annular, one a total, that is rocking through the United States where I happen to live. You happen to live somebody else, place else, there are other eclipses that you're, you'll be able to see. But I was thinking like, wouldn't it be fun to get a critical mass of nature journalers together at the same place at the same time during a total solar eclipse? 
And then I looked up in a few years, there's one coming up in Australia. So what if we worked together with the Aussies to make a Wild Wonder Down Under conference that would coincide with their solar eclipse? So, and if we booked it now, we could get someplace probably a lot cheaper because in a few years, when they get on to the idea that, that we're in the path of the eclipse, like, so don't tell anybody. But I'm going to look into, like, how could we, like, book a convention center or something like that in Australia, right? Um, at the time that, that there's a total solar eclipse, <laughs> right? Um, so if, if, that, if that idea comes through... We'll hope to see you there. It could be cool for a wild wonder down under. Um, so I'd like to uh, check in with you folks. Um, what um, are some ideas that you have um, to that we could do um, to, uh, to, to enhance and extend your viewing experience? On, um, on if you happen to be in the phenomena of an eclipse. Um, and what we can do is you can um, use the raise hand function. Um, you can also, if you can't find that on your computer, you can turn on your screen and you can like do a little dance or wave at us or raise your hand and kind of go like, and then we'll know that you've got an idea, an eclipse idea um, for journals. And I'm going to bring in the mad botanist, um, Avea. Hey there. Um, so this is less about eclipse directly. And oh, here, sorry, I can spotlight. Uh, oh, sorry. And then I and then I made you go away. I did not mean to do that. Here. Oh, okay. Here oh. we are. Now we're both oh, here. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Um, there was a question that that Lois had asked that I'd been asking myself just last night too, uh, about since the sun always shines in space, why doesn't the moon always get red each month um, as it goes through the Earth's shadow? And I was doing... is asking that is really thinking about what's going on here. See, that's a brilliant question. What and what I want to encourage everybody to do is to. Like sometimes we're kind of like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. That's that's why it's there. But but whoever asked that question is then thinking the thing behind the thing. The moon's going around each month. Why aren't I seeing that each month? And then then I cut you off. So I'm just pointing out awesome question. So go on. And I was gonna say that that a fun thing to try to do is that we usually diagram moon and stuff one way. I recommend a little thing I learned about called orthographic projection. And the idea behind that is where you do both a top view and a side view and compare to each other, because what you're going to see Wait, is move, move your, there we go. It's this one's messy, so I drew a better side view down below. But your top view is going to look like what you sort of what you just drew, where you see the Earth here and the moon here, and you're going to assume, oh, they're in alignment, but that's a top view. The side view on a normal month isn't going to look like that. The moon might be slightly above the Earth or below the Earth, so the shadow is just going over here into space. It's not falling on the Earth's surface. So, better explanation, normal month might look like this. We're seeing the shadow, though, and we're like, oh, well, there, there's our new moon, or we're not seeing it because it's during the daytime. Um, or maybe if you play Where's Waldo with the moon, you can. But the point <laughs> is that you're not going to get the shadow on the Earth, even if it is a new moon. And from our perspective, it's a new moon because the shadow's way up here. But then during the eclipse, then we get lucky and it goes like this because the eclipse is not like the moon is not always at this angle. Um, the, the moon is usually up at like this angle or something like that. And I'm guessing I'd have to like play with it, but I'm guessing it's similar for a lunar eclipse as well. I'm guessing that the moon is usually like up here or down here and we're seeing, you know, the full moon because we're seeing, you know, the nice, but then, then it actually 
at some months it actually crosses into the Earth's shadow. And then that's when you're getting your lunar eclipses because then you're seeing the um, the actual shadow over it. And so and so that's why I want to recommend thinking just, just to play with things, consider orthographic projection so that you can compare what the upper view looks like from the side view because it might be a bit of a different view, if that's helpful. That is that is very helpful. Um, so and so just sort of to visualize this another way, if you are the sun, your view is the sun, my head is the earth, and this guy is the moon, right? So every month, this guy goes around, right? And if the plane that the moon was orbiting in was always like this, then every month there would be here a solar eclipse where the moon is blocked, where the, from the sun's perspective, it, the eclipse looks like the moon blocks part of the earth, right? From the perspective on the earth, the sun, that's you, gets blocked by the moon, and so it gets dark where you are. Um, so if they were all on the same plane, this little guy would go around like that every month. But sometimes when it goes around, it is dipping down below, and sometimes it is up above. And so you don't, it's, it's, it's not always going to be right in this same plane. So that's, that's, that's great. Now, and I noticed, I noticed on your little diagram, you've got the umbra and penumbra going on. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Should we unpack that a little bit? That's kind of a cool thing. That would be really, really fun. We should totally do that. And then also, um, some other time, sometime we should talk about scale since we like to talk about the next generation science standards. It's fun to look at the different scale between these. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then also for funsies, a question that I got that I got to asking last night about the subsolar point that I just found out where there's one spot on Earth that's closer to the sun than any other at any given point, but that constantly moves around and it's usually between a certain area of Earth. But my question is, why isn't the place where we're seeing the eclipses the best? Why isn't that the same as the subsolar point according to this map I saw? But that's another question. Let's go into the umbras <laughs> and penumbra. So, so this 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 umbra penumbra phenomenon um, um, actually answers an interesting an interesting observation that some people made. Um, there, there's 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 a thought experiment that like, if you take a big heavy flashlight and you take a tennis ball, right, um, and you put that tennis ball into the beam of the flashlight and you shine that on a wall. Here's my question for you folks. Will the shadow of the tennis ball on the wall be bigger or smaller than the tennis ball? You've got the tennis ball in your hand. You're holding the flashlight. You're projecting it on the wall. Is the, sh is the shadow of the tennis ball bigger or smaller? And I'm going to tie this into the umbra and penumbra. Don't worry. We're going to get there, right? So type into the chat what you think. Ooh, calling you out, right? What and, do you think? And I, and I have a question for you, Jack, that we don't have to answer just yet. That little fun thing that you told me about with the fence, does that relate? Oh. Um, I haven't figured the full fence thing business this the business out. But um, that would be kind of an interesting for us to, 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 to look at. Oh, and I see Anne's got her hand up. So Anne, we'll be with you in a moment. Let's, we're going to geek out on this thing for a second. Then we're going to umbra and penumbra. And then we're going to join Anne Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. So it's bigger, right? So why, why is it then that if you have this, this tennis ball, its shadow is bigger, the shadow of the moon during an eclipse going across the earth is smaller than the moon. Why is that shadow getting smaller 
but the sh you can you, you can't make that happen with the tennis ball and the flashlight right so you've got the tennis ball the flashlight the shadow of the ball is always bigger but when the moon comes between the earth and the uh the and and the sun its shadow is smaller than the moon huh that ain't right well it turns out that the model that we're doing can can because it actually here let's challenge ourselves can anybody come up with an explanation why it's matter if you use a wider source of light towards the tennis ball oh jen can we bring jen on Jen just nailed it, all right? All right, yeah, think about what, so Jen says, does it matter if you use a wider source of light towards the tennis ball, right? So with the flashlight and the tennis ball, small pinpoint light here, light coming out like that, and the ball, its shadow is getting bigger. What if the light that is being projected is bigger than the thing that's casting the shadow can we bring can we, jen do you want to come on I'm there. I'm there okay let's see if we can bring um jen oh uh, i can't use my video for a second but you can look at this lovely picture of my dog now what oh. happens the suspense oh okay let's see we're having a hard time finding you and bringing you in i raise so, my hand yeah, yeah. Oh, oh there we go um so uh there you are with the dog <laughs> Um, so, 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 Jen, um, talk us through this. Uh, talk, talk us uh, through this idea um, where you're thinking about if the light source is bigger than the thing that's casting the shadow. That this is this is this is cool. Well, I was thinking a bigger light source since the sun is the most the giant light source that I can picture. Most yeah. giant. That's not a word. Four hundred um, times bigger than the moon. Right? Yeah. So, that's so if that passing by, I don't know. So, I'm getting confused with the tennis ball. The tennis ball okay. seems so, like so, it would so, give effect. Yeah, let, let's make a diagram, right? Um, let, let's let's make a diagram here, and and what I'm going to do is you're you're absolutely right. So that was that was that that's the key insight is that how big are the things that are casting the shadow and not. See, this is what like figuring stuff out, like thinking about things is fun to do. And, but you can see how if you kind of, if you just sort of went like, well, that doesn't work and you stopped your thinking there, it's easy to confuse ourselves. Um, I've heard some people say that because the tennis ball shadow is bigger, this is evidence against a model of the um, of, of of the relationship between the sun and the earth and the moon with as the moon going around the earth. They say it can't or because that shadow doesn't work. But let's check this out. Let's check this out. All right. So does the angle matter too of the light source? Yes, it sure does. Here is a bigger sun, still not to scale. Here is a moon not to scale. Right. The turns out that the um, the moon is four hundred times smaller than than the sun. So these are obviously not to scale, right? But from any point on the moon here, sorry, on the sun, light is coming out in all directions from this. If you were in a spaceship right here and you looked at the moon here, it would look bright. If you're in a spaceship right here and you looked at the, the sorry, in the, the sun right here, it would look bright because photons would be coming out towards you. That means that there are photons that are coming from up here on this side of the sun that are coming down and hitting the earth, right? Other photons from this point are going up and up, up this way. Photons from this direction are coming down. Yes. 
And so this makes an area on the far side there that is in shadow. But photons are being emitted from, from all over here. So let's, let's do this. Let's go from here. What about a photon that comes down this way? It hits the Earth and it gets in shadow. A photon that comes down this way comes here. So what I'm going to do is I'm drawing. So essentially, what I'm doing is from the top and the bottom of the sun here, I am drawing lines from one to the top to either side of either side of the sun. So some some things some of these rays are hitting here. And being blocked, others are blasting. Does this diagram make sense? I get it. All right now, let's flip this up the other way. Right, so from here or from here, this means now here is my here's my Earth down here. Beautiful Earth. Yeah, but my, I've got my, my Earth over here. This area here is fully in shadow from both directions. There's no place on the sun that can give you shadow into this area. Mm -hmm. If you came from here, you'd be blocked by the Earth. You came from here, you'd be blocked by the Earth. You come from over here, anywhere along here, you can't get into that triangle. But this area out here is blocked from some photons, right? So if I were coming from here, uh, light, light coming from here can't get over here. But light coming from over here can. Similarly, on this side of this little triangle here, light coming from here can get over here, bop, 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 right? My photons can come here, but they can't get over here. That means that if you are out here, I'm going to call this place number one. This gets light from over here and over here. It's in the light. It is not in shadow. There's nothing casting a shadow here. Here, if you're in place number two, you are in partial shadow from light that comes over here, but you're getting light from over here. So it is kind of a medium. It is shadow light. And if you are in this little wedge that is back here, that is in full darkness. And notice that that makes this a cone, a cone, a tapering cone that gets smaller towards this end. If the Earth was a little bit further out here where that cone attenuated, um, we there the 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 sun would um, the sun <clears throat> uh, when when there's a when the when the moon goes across as an eclipse, an eclipse would happen, and you might see a little bit of diminishing light, but you wouldn't see these full eclipse effects. We are lucky enough that the Earth is close enough here that when the Earth is here, part of this cone of shadow hits the Earth. So if you were to take a look at this from the top, what you'd see is a core shadow called the umbra. with a circle around it of light, of a circle of partial shadow around it. And that's this. So this is this partial shadow. And this is the full shadow here. And notice that this allows you to have, because you're the thing producing the light is big, 
bigger than the thing that is casting the shadow, you will get a shadow that then is smaller than the thing that is casting the shadow. And we, we also see, this is kind of cool, you then have this sort of bullseye, this would then predict the sort of bullseye effect, which is what happens. And as this rolls across the sphere of the earth, when it is right in the middle of it, pointing right down on it, um, you get these things are circles. And the shape of these turns to ellipses as they get towards the sides of the earth, which is what you would predict mm -hmm. on a spiritual silver earth. So if you're looking at this close to noon, you would get something patterns like this. If you're looking at an eclipse near sunrise or sunset, the pattern would be like this. Which makes sense with a spherical Earth. So, Jen, mad props for making the light source bigger. That this is this is why I think that like these things are 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 fun because it kind of gets our brain like 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 what what would be going on like what causes that, and that's where we want to be geeking out. That's where we want to be kind of whatever, like, huh, right? Let's bring in Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, hey there. Ask a question quick. Oh, yes. Let's, uh, Jen. So, so, like, say in California where there's no, we're not in the path of totality at north, would that just be the photons going around the moon that would be, like, underneath that diagram? Or yes. upper, whatever? Yes. So, so, so we are in zone one. Okay. Right. Absolutely right. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's cool, isn't it? I, yeah. I, it's like sort of just sort of figuring these things out. Like the eclipse is this invitation to kind of get our our take our perspective outside of our regular frame of reference. Um. Hey there, Anne. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Jack. How are you? I'm. I'm. I am feeling good. Good. Geeking out in your happy place. <laughs> uh, this is my happy place. That's right. Oh, right. So I just wanted to raise a question that somebody else raised. I hope you don't mind, Miriam, but I saw your question about the wind and it was so cool. Like, what a great hypothesis. Will the wind change when maybe when it, the eclipse is ending? And I'm thinking the reason it might do that would be the big change in temperature really quickly. And that could cause the air to want to go from cold place to a warm place. Um, but I don't know. I think that's a great, uh, great I wonder. And thank you, Miriam, for the question. That That is cool. Let's Let's think about what we might expect with that. So... Wind usually goes from a place of high pressure to a place of low pressure. A place that is warmed by the sun, that air rises, creating a low pressure area underneath that. So places where there are thermals of air rising up, um, as that air is going up, that leaves a void behind, a partial vacuum, which things can get sucked into, right? Mm -hmm. So heat goes up, air comes in, um, and the, so high pressure, uh, so, so low pressure causes air to come in towards you. So if I were to heat up the area where I am, my air goes up, I would have other air wind blowing into where I am. If I cooled the spot where I am, then what would, what would happen to the air pressure? Mm, but the air gets denser. Right. So... 
air pressure is going to go. Air pressure will go up. So now, I, if it's, I'm in a colder place, I've got this bubble of, of pressure of, above me that is keeping it's, it is keeping that other air out from coming in towards me. So I wonder then if when it gets darker, would we expect it to heat up or cool down? Cool down. Yeah. Then that's giving me, um, so it's, it's cooled down. I've got this sort of bubble of cool over me. I'm thinking of that as like armor against air blowing into where I am. I wonder if it will get still mm -hmm. underneath the eclipse. And then as, the, so as the, and then as the eclipse goes away, you'd get more wind. So that there'd be wind on either side of it, more still in the middle. Does that make sense? Thinking? It seems like it. You'll have to tell us. But, but, yeah. So I will definitely be looking for that. Right. Um, but I want to, to, to make sure that I because if I make a prediction and I find that, then I that makes me think that my way of thinking about these things makes sense. If I don't find that, then there's something wrong with my thinking about what's going on here. But but sitting here right now, I'm betting that under that eclipse. Um, the air will get still. I think so. And then as it goes away, that will break up and the wind will pick up. That yeah. was, that was, see, see, this is, this is fun. So you've got a phenomena and then we kind of give our, we invite ourselves to geek out with these things in different ways. This is, that's going to make looking at wind speed, which now things to do, I need to, um, so I want to get temperature down there. And wouldn't it be interesting to have a barometer? Ooh, yeah. So that you could detect a change in air pressure underneath there. Yeah. So note to self, must bring um, my little sort of weather uh, mate buddy here. Um, this can detect a little fan there blows around, um, gives me wind speed, temperature. Um, and this has been, been sitting idle for a little while. It hasn't come out to play. Hmm. Does and it take batteries? Does it what? Does it need batteries or a charge? Um, it's, it looks like it's currently, it has its batteries in. Okay. Make sure it's charged up for your eclipse. And, um, and then, um, so I'll be, I'll be looking for that. Yeah. Very cool. So the other thing, I'm just sad about one thing today. What row? And that is that in my nature journal, I did not start a list of how many times the word phenomena was used. It's oh, was, was, was this a banner day? What we should do is we should start a, a, <laughs> a, a bingo game. Totally. Right. Yeah. And like that and, and like phenomena, um, which should be like one of the, the squares on, on the bingo game. So for people who regularly watch this, um uh send uh send, I'm John Muir Laws at uh, johnmuirlaws.com. Shoot me an email with things that you think should be on our bingo card. Um <laughs> and we'll make a little uh bingo card. That would be 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 fun. Was this so, was this a high phenomena day? Very high. Phenomena, phenomena, na 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 na. Yes. Yeah, um, and for those of us who cannot help but think of the Muppets song every time we, 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 we um, hear. Uh, yep. Uh, and and we would go play that right now, but then um, YouTube would flag this as as pirating somebody else's com uh, content. And uh, <laughs> but uh, if you haven't done that recently, we encourage everybody to. Oh, let let's just do that anyway, just because maybe to kind of bring us out here. Um, should we uh, kind of, Avea, uh, 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 can well, you find it? Avea, just put it in the chat. Oh, Already she there. just put it into the chat, mana, mana. And I can always cut this part out and tell people to just imagine the song if they oh, like. Yeah, should, should, we, should we go there, everybody?
Ah, oh, I feel better. Uh, there you go. Yeah, uh, every once in a while, we have to sort of remind ourselves what's really important, and the Muppet Show takes us there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think Alice had her hand up too. Oh, all right. right? So, uh, what mm -hmm. was that? she had um, she right? she had said that she, um, somebody else had already asked her question. Oh, oh I believe. Okay. Um. So yeah, what what I think fun to do is to sort of figure out is is to on these sorts of things, sort of for us to play with what doesn't make sense to us, and to 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 seek understanding about these sorts of things, on any phenomenon that we look at. There's another, right? Oh, do 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 do. Um, um, on any every phenomenon. Um, the amount that we understand is small. The level of depth and complexity on that phenomenon is vast and infinite, but we get the subjective feeling that I understand what's going on here. And so I just want to encourage people to look for more of the mystery of the world around them. And the more we do that, the more we're going to see that um, we... Uh, it like figuring stuff out is fun and it keeps us humble in the face of this 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 wonderful um world of of, of mystery um i'd like to bring lois into the conversation um um uh, and thank you so much um and you can unmute oh you already have hello so <laughs> I'm still a little bit confused okay. about why, if there is an opening that is triangular or rectangular or whatever, why the spot on the ground is round. Now, not saying anything about eclipses, just there's a tree, it's got leaves, they overlap in various patterns. They are not making circle holes up there. If I look up there, they're not circle holes. But if I look on the ground, what do those sunspots look like, and why? Isn't it see like this? This is a, like a great example for me of how of why humility is so important. I can make a diagram of how a pinhole camera works, right? This is this the same the same phenomenon is going on with a pinhole camera. You poke a little hole in that little box, and it, and 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 it's projecting. Why is it that a big hole doesn't do that and why a little pinprick does? Um, you get your hole to be too big and you see the shape of the branches, but you know, smaller, we, all of a sudden they turn into pretty circular projections of the sun. That is, um, so one thing we can do is we can, um, I, I think I can, and I encourage everybody else to, um, I want to look up again, how does a pinhole camera work? Like, what is the big why behind why the triangular hole makes a circular projection of the sun? Um, and what is, what is the threshold where a shape of a certain size will make a projection of the sun but larger than that will be the shadow of the shape. So where is that threshold? Um, how does that change with the distance to the object that we're projecting on? Um, my full answer to your question is I don't have a good answer to your question, um, but that makes me want to, but that will be, um, the thing that I'm geeking out on at the end of this workshop. Because like that's this sort of fundamental thing behind all this sort of stuff. Like here's the colander doing this. And but then I, we scratch. And then I, I, I want to admit to all of you here and to you, Lois, that I had the subjective exp uh, feeling that, yeah, I understand what's going on with the colander. They're each projecting this thing. But we just scratch beneath the surface like, why? <laughs> right? And... 
And I'm like, I have no idea. So that's going to be my next thing to geek out on. And this is kind of when we talk about rabbit holes in this group. This is this is an example of a rabbit hole where you kind of this kind of get, scratches your curiosity itch. You want to follow it here. You want to follow it here. And ways we can follow rabbit holes partly. It's we can do literature searches and look for explanations from other people. And then we also want to back this up with kind of tinkering ourselves and messing around with things and looking at what the what the the, the wind speed is doing in the eclipse and these sorts of things where we say, like, I think I know what's going on. If I make predictions from that, do I see those things? That's that's a great question. So I think that maybe what I'll do is I'll get a piece of cardboard and I'll cut a triangular, you know, half inch hole in it. And then I'll hold it in the sun next to whatever and see what happens when it's really close. I know it'll be triangular. And then yeah. put it away and 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 see, you know, where it's going to turn circular. And would it be interesting to do that also with holes of different sizes? Exactly. Triangles of different sizes and then put those at different distances. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like this. One piece of cardboard, you can cut two holes in it, you know, near, near each other, a half inch and a quarter inch. And then when you do it, you can see, uh, see it's, it's all triangular. No, no, no. Oh, the little one went circular here. Wouldn't yes. that be cool? That would be really fun. Now I want that card to have a whole series of triangles of different sizes. Uh -huh and and see like is like is there a linear relationship between the size of the hole and the distance is that a non-linear relationship is there what is the point where that stops working is there a point where that stops working oh and I, then oh, oh, oh bring it oh bring one, it one more get your flashlight out and see how it works with your flashlight because that's a, a, a pinpoint thing instead of a broad thing. <laughs> I'll see what you that did should there. Keep you in, in, in I'll see what you did there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. This is going to be a fun after. Are you going to do this this afternoon? I, no, I have, I have medical things this afternoon, but uh. I can do it before next week. Oh, okay. Can we check in with this deep geeking out next week? <laughs> if I'm here, I'll report. If okay. I'm not so here, the, the I'll next send time you I see you, don't, don't, don't worry. If you're not here, but the next time I you, you see you, um, put into the chat whenever you get get on. I'm here, and and I played with triangles, and Avea is going to spot it in the chat, and we'll bring you on, and we will deeply geek out. Good. And um, and you can you all can play with triangles out there. Everybody can try it. Yes. Wouldn't right. hurt. And then you think like, like, how would I go about sort of setting up this experiment? I've got two variables, size of the hole and distance. Actually, then bring in the third variable, different types of light sources. What is this like with a incandescent bulb flashlight? What is it like with sunlight? What is it like with uh, do I have any broad lights? So that's the sun, the broad lights. Yeah. Um, so I have a feeling that we're going to end up with something that looks like a reverse penumbra, penumbra where there'll be a cone of light coming through that hole. And when it's when the point touches, then you see the shape. And when the point doesn't touch, that you'll see it circular. I, that's my guess. I don't know if it's true or not. Okay, so 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 this, all right? We're we're gonna go here. So for for you, let's see how many people are still on. For you, twenty eight or who are still here, I want to share with you a video that I made Ooh. that ties into what Lois is talking about, where I found a phenomena, and that's for you, um, a phenomena that, um, yeah, that one is. We're gonna see how many we go. Um, I, 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 that, um, I that did not make sense to me. Like if I were to magically invent the world and how things are and how they look, this would not have occurred to me. And it deals with shadows. 
in a way that where you're talking about the sort of reverse penumbra thing makes me think that so so Lois, check this out. Okay. Check this out. This is this is bizarre. And I am going to go to um imports. Go and where is it? Aha. Aha. Yep, found it. I'm gonna open this. And all right. Are you ready for this? All right. This um, I'm hoping that the sound will come off on this. I'm going to share share sound. Oh, yep. This. All right. Are you, uh, Lois, are you seeing um, a, a big fence? And I am a seeing a big fence. Yes, you are successfully sharing. All right. Let's do this. Hey there. Do I have a cool phenomena for you? Check How about that, <laughs> man? Here is a hurricane fence right next to the uh, ball field. And as you might expect with these little diamonds, the shadow of this hurricane fence is little diamonds. Okay, nothing unexpected there. But watch this. We're going to move away from the edge of the fence. Take a look at what happens. Here, we're at the fence line. Right here, I'm about a meter out. Let's go two meters. It's starting to get fuzzy. You expected that, right? Mm -hmm. Wait for it, because it's about to get really weird. I'd like to explore three meters mm -hmm. uh, and look for phenomena that I don't understand, things that are really different than what I expected to see. Four meters out, getting kind of this mm -hmm. red pattern. But watch this, watch this transition, something really interesting is going on here. See that? <laughs> what I would expect to be um, dark lines against a light background. We have the opposite. Mm -hmm. As we go further away from the fence, we have that diamond pattern, but with light lines. So what is happening happening here optically? See if you can make a diagram that explains what you think is going on. Can you map this out? You don't have to be right, but can you make a little model? See, like, I think these are the principles that are going on. That's interesting. There's a clue. Follow the dark lines. So that so was. I would, I would expect that if you were to able to follow that far enough out, you'd get back to, back to having dark lines. <laughs> and what makes you say that? So the, it's the shadows of the, of the, the wires. So it's the shadows of the lines. And as you get further away, the shadow, think of that penumbra kind of thing like you were talking about, the shadows are more diffuse and they're overlapping. 
So when you get to the part that is, you're seeing, you you're think you're seeing white lines, what you're really seeing is the overlapping of the dark shadows have gotten to a point where they're overlapping everything except this little space. And I think if you went further away, they would continue to show more and more and eventually get back so that the the overlapping would be back in dark lines again. That's my thought. I don't know if it's true. But wouldn't that be wouldn't that be cool thing to look for? So let me let me let me repeat back what I think I heard. You're saying that what you've got is the shadows getting brought more and more broad. Mm -hmm. So they end up filling these spaces um except for the little places where they're they're not they're, um Expect for the spaces that were sort of the original sort of holes between these things. I think the shadows are overlapping each other. The shadows are overlapping each other. And yeah. so you get some places where you get two shadows and that'll be darker and some places where there's only one shadow and that'll be lighter. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. I may be wrong, yeah. but that's my thought. But what, what, what really kind of wiggled me was 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 that like I I would ex I, I I want I'm I'm thinking like shadows the further out everything gets more fuzzy, mm -hmm. right? Like putting the Gaussian blur on. Whoop, all right, there's your shadow, right? And um, but it seemed to me that at this phase here, we still had crisp edges. I'm seeing more crispness than I think, than my brain thinks should be there. But think about it this way. If the shadow of one line is two of those squares, each mm -hmm. line has a shadow that's almost two of those squares, then where there isn't two shadows, it would look lighter. That's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> And it the, the seems that things are slightly brighter at the intersections of these. Right, because there's fewer shadows. Mm -hmm. And oh, so the intersections of these are the centers of the diamonds. The gap, yes. The gaps in the shadows are the lines. And if you have a gap in a shadow one way and a gap in a shadow the other way, there's more light getting through. You are dangerous, Lois. <laughs> I right, see this is this is I this this I, I want to run back and 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 play with this spot some more. <laughs> and and is, isn't this fun? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't this fun? <sighs> like we we get to try to figure things out. And and the 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 mode that most people do for 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 trying to figure things out. Is like even, even I said it earlier on this. Uh, I, I said like I think I'll go like I'll do some research on pinhole cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so all the stuff that people know about pinhole cameras came from people like us just messing around with things instead of holding things at different lengths. And and I think that um, there's there's nothing wrong with doing research, but. What if we can also let ourselves kind of get back to the sort of tinkering that you described? I, th uh, I think research is a word that has changed meaning over the years. Oh, when more I first heard research, it meant you went out, you looked at something, you tried to figure out how it worked. You, you, you did what we're talking about doing here. And today, when people say, I'm going to research something, they mean I'm going to go look up and see what other people talk about it. So yeah. you're not really doing original research. You're just doing a, uh, I think we would have called that uh, a review of other people's research. Yeah, I like which that. Is, which a is a fine review. way to learn, yeah. but it's still, yeah. it's more and fun it, to do it yourself. Yeah, there's, there, there's we're, we're, yeah, we're not saying there's anything wrong with, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants and looking um, at things that other people have figured out and kind of like, oh, okay. But, but also at the same time, let's, let's, let's get our tinker on, right? Let's let give ourselves permission to try to figure things out. 
Um, and also be aware at the same time. Um, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said it well, that like the universe is under no obligation to be simply understood by you right? or me, right? So the fact that I don't understand something doesn't mean that it's not understandable. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that some things, quantum mechanics, you know, really take, you know, a lifetime mm -hmm. of, of, of studying. So there are people who are kind of looking at things and have an understanding that is beyond what I'm going to be able to get to with my lay understanding. The amount of research, the amount of information that is coming out in all fields is, is exponentially growing. And there's no way that any lay person could keep up with that. Um, I think quantum mechanics is one of the best examples of this, um, where you'll see lay people who have read a popularized book on quantum mechanics, where people are saying like, this is all kind of done with math, but let's sort of um, do a thought experiment. And they listen to the thought experiment, and then they have the subject of feeling that they understand it. That's yeah. just our Dunning-Kruger effect saying like, oh, I get this. <laughs> but there are things that are really, really complex. And I'm not there yet. I don't understand any of the math in quantum mechanics. And that means I don't understand quantum mechanics. I can listen to somebody say, well, you know, th this is, uh, uh, here, here, here's, here's sort of a, a simplified uh, explanation of it and would make this weird phenomenon happen. It's quantum entanglement. And I can read something about quantum entanglement. It doesn't mean that I understand quantum entanglement. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I think that, we all need to remember when we're doing this sort of stuff is that just because I have to hypothesize a possible way that it could be happening doesn't mean I'm right. Now, if I were to go further from what you said, I would go, now, how can I figure out how to, to decide if I'm correct? You know, if I just had one slat and I, and I go further and further away, it gets fuzzier, it gets wider. Yeah, okay, good. That, that confirms part of it. But what if I, you know, those, um, those expandable uh, baby uh, safety things? Yes. That you, yep. uh, you, yeah. And they're, they're wooden slats parallel to each other, and you can open them up and you can close them down. So what if we took one of those and then opened it up? And then and you're we were changing the size see, of the holes. It, it means that the, sh the shadow from each of the slats would be the same because it's the same slat, but the relationship between and the thing next to it would be different. So we could see whether overlapping did anything. Still yeah. wouldn't prove it, but at least it would be fun. It, it would be fun. We get, get us closer and you could say like, if this idea is true, I would expect to see this. Yeah. And then, and then as you're, you're, you're saying, so don't expect, we have, we have a, our, our brains bias us towards the first explanation that we have that comes to us for a phenomenon. Um, and because it, it gets in there first before everybody else, our brains you know, tend to sort of be like, yeah, that must be it. And that's one reason why when we're coming up with possible explanations, um, so rather than say, why do you think that might be? We want to say to ourselves, what are some possible, um, what are some possible explanations of why that might be? And intentionally get ourselves to come up with more than one so that, as, as, so that we don't anchor on that first one. That's right. So uh, Avea has pointed out that's the, the, um, the, the anchoring bias that we have. We kind of, once we've got something stuck in our head, it's mm -hmm. it just, it feels so right because it was the first thing that I thought of. And, and that happens in science too people will get something and until something else comes along that doesn't fit the theory that is proves that they're wrong people are going to hold on to that and that that's happened over and over and over in the scientific world or, or in the human world in right? the human world but yeah, I think that, that is that, the that happens. yeah yeah that that happens in science because that is something that we human beings do and scientists mm -hmm. are human and we have all these sort of tools and things to try to protect us from that, but we still often make that that human mistake. Mm -hmm. 
and but we we we're we're trying not to. So I don't think it's something that is that is that mistake is specific to oh agree. Yeah, to 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 science, and and things like, um, you know, are are the 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 danger. The big danger is that once we think we know that, that something is is right, mm -hmm. we look for examples of where we see that again. And this idea of confirmation bias, instead of disproving ah, the thing, right. Somebody Instead put of, that in the chat. We look for disproof. Right. We we try to we take our best ideas and try to shoot them down. And if we do everything we can to try to shoot that down and we are unable to do that, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean we're right. <laughs> but it's a good theory until it's yeah. disproven. Yeah, yeah. That, that it's 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 it it is our best explanation for, for for now so something that I, I i a kind of a useful kind of turn of phrase that at, when you when i first say it people go like whoa are you a science denier like what's going on with you right science is not about finding truth yeah science so, is about finding explanations right the the best current explanation that we have to that has the best fit for the data that we have at this time. Mm -hmm. And this is our most useful explanation mm -hmm. with the data that we have so far. It doesn't mean we're right. And we're going to continue to try to poke holes in it and find ourselves wrong. But if it is, if it, if it fits the data very, very well, it can even predict things. And if the more that it predicts things, the more useful it is. So useful explanations allow us to navigate this world without ever having to philosophically wonder if this is truth or not, because we can never get there. That's for philosophers to play with. And we looking at the empirical observable world around us, we, um, we don't get to play in that pool. Um, Lois, I am, thank you so much for, uh, for, for sharing those thoughts with us. Um, I also want to thank uh, Kay Hones um, for um, sharing uh, resources to help people enjoy and encounter this eclipse. I hope that, um, and I also would like to, to, to thank uh, Avea, the mad botanist. Um, hold on, I'm gonna bring you on because I like your Cthulhu hat. Um, octopi, oh. an octopi. <laughs> <laughs> A very, very nice cephalopod moment we've got going on here. Um, uh, I, I, I want to, so if you think of yourself, well, this is great if I could go see the eclipse, um, but you don't have to. Here's what I think we want to do is use this example of an eclipse as a, and a phenomenon, um, <laughs> a phenomenon to, um, to engage with and to look at what is happening. And we can find phenomena all around us that are worthy of our geeking out on right and um and 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 that is that's joyful that's fun and it and when we kind of cut our teeth on like weird things that are going on with shadows we are making it more possible for us to also make those that those kind of what we're trying to do is practice we're practicing critical thinking when we're doing that and then we hope that we can apply that to more things and more places in our life so this ideas of like what you can do with the eclipse um some of these things like you know use these glasses this way that's yeah that's specific to the eclipse but this larger notion of how much can you kind of uh, gather from this experience. Um, so like, you know, Anne, you got me thinking about, okay, when we're out there, we're going to be, we're going to be playing with wind speed and we've got a prediction. I'm going to be looking for the mid eclipse lull and see, and I like to sort of, will I be in the middle of a bubble of, um, of, uh, uh, so higher pressure, yeah, so the the air goes up 
then it is lower pressure underneath it. Maybe did I, when I was talking about that earlier, did I flip those? I don't mm -hmm. know. I probably did because um, high is low and low is high. Um, but, uh, you know, how, how that, that, that's, that's, that's sort of deep geeking out that we can do there. In addition to that, just by the fence, by the playground, you know, there are phenomena that await if we have eyes to see them. How many are we up to now, Anne? So <laughs> well, many, I can't. I lost count. I got lost count. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and watch the recording and just <laughs> actually get the data on the phenomena. Uh, on the phenomena. Hey, Jack? Yes. Um, Kay wrote in the chat, happy Pi Day. Do you know about Pi Day? Uh, we do. Let's, let's, is, is Susan <laughs> Beckhart on the phone with us? On, on the she, line said, with us? she said she had to go and she was incredibly sad because we were just getting mathy. <laughs> so she says that she's very eagerly awaiting this recording um, so that she can go back and geek out retroactively. Um, so, uh, so Lois, tell us about Pi Day. Pi, 3.14. Come on, everybody, all together. One, one five, nine. This is yeah. Pi. <laughs> it goes on forever. But 3.14, well, that's March 14th. So they declared this to be Pi Day. And I, I'm not a mathematician, so for me, well, I use the other kind of pie. <laughs> oh, I think we all deserve pie today. Yes, yes. Um, I'm going to try, so uh, on that note, um, my goals for today, oh, look at that pie you've got going on. I need a little help from my friends. Oh, I'll give you a hand eating that. Uh, it's, it's long gone. This one, however, um, my husband just made one of these last night. Oh, see? Yeah. Okay. Happy Pi Day, everybody. Happy Pi Day. Um, folks, uh, let's get curious. Let's go play in this world. Um, we have uh, this, this little moment to kind of go and, 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 and see and learn and think. The more that we kind of let our brain out and practice thinking with it, it's so much fun. It's so much fun to get curious and then to have something you can do about it. Um, dear friends, thank you for being here. Again, thank you to, to Kay, our um, ambassador for the eclipse. Um, Avea, thank you so much for moderating with me. Thank you to your cephalopod for keeping your head warm. And um, uh, Lois, your curiosity and Chadwick, um, also, thank you so much for the work that you and Point Blue Conservation Science are doing to help us bring this, this level of thought and attention to the dynamics of the natural world so that we can get real data for real, solving real conservation problems. Um, it is, it's wonderful, the work you're doing. And the work which we do in looking at the shadows on a fence ties into the sort of larger scientific endeavor of trying to understand what's going on on this complex changing planet. Until we meet again, everyone, take care.